This episode is brought to you in association with Janice Henderson Investors. It is a marketing communication, not for onward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Past performance does not predict future returns, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only. References made to individual securities does not constitute a recommendation to buy, sell or hold any security, investment strategy or market sector, and should not be assumed to be profitable. Janus Henderson Investors, its affiliated advisor or its employees may have a position in the securities mentioned, not for distribution in European Union member countries. My name is Andrew Chaguri, and today I'm joined by David Smith, Portfolio Manager of Henderson High Income, to talk about how companies are dealing with rising input costs as demand weakens, the comeback of bonds, areas where he's finding opportunities to invest, the transition towards cleaner energy, and the outlook for UK dividends in a recessionary environment. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, good to be here. So despite the uncertainty and volatility markets have experienced in recent years, Henderson High Income has grown its dividend for 10 consecutive years. What is the secret source to achieving such an accomplishment? I think it comes down to a number of factors, really. I mean, firstly, the investment process that we have. We typically like to look for good quality companies with strong business models that can't be competed away with high barriers to entry. And those sort of businesses generally have a bit more of a defensive quality about them, so they can continue to grow their profitability, grow their cash flows, and ultimately grow their dividends through a cycle. I'm talking about, I guess, consumer staples, Diageo's of this world, Unilever of this world, etc., where their ability to, through thick and thin, to continue to grow their earnings, cash flows, and dividends. So I think the core of the portfolio is generally towards those type of businesses. I think also what we look for in terms of companies is having a sensible dividend policy. We don't want companies to pay out all their cash flows as dividends because clearly if they do that, they're not investing in their own business to grow going forward. Yes, we're income fund managers, we want the dividend, but we also want companies to invest in themselves mm so they can grow their cash flows and ultimately grow the dividends. Because ultimately, it's not just about yield. It's about dividend yield plus your dividend growth that mm. produces your best total returns. And then thirdly, it's really about making sure that the companies we own have strong balance sheets. With all of the will in the world, companies will get into trouble at some point in the cycle, etc. But as long as they've got strong balance sheets, they can wear the difficult times out and continue to pay and grow those dividends over that time period. So in terms of the investment process, those are the businesses we're looking for. And that generally leads to companies that can grow their dividends over the longer term. I suppose the other point is being an investment trust, one of the key advantages is having revenue reserves. One of the things that we've done since I've been on the trust is not just grow the dividend, but also try and build up the revenue reserves. So we were in a good position when we went into the dividend recession that we saw in the pandemic in 2020. Without those revenue reserves, we wouldn't have been able to do that 10-year dividend growth track record. What we saw, we paid out a modest amount in 2020, again in 21, and actually it's good that we saw in 2022 that we had the dividend covered again for the first time for a number of years. So in a good position, and actually because we were a bit more resilient, having the bond portfolio as well helped that in 2020. It was good that actually we only used a modest amount. So where we stand today, the revenue reserves are still at sort of 8.5 million which covers around 65% of the full year dividends. So we've done well over the next 10 years, but given where the revenue reserves still are, mm. actually it gives you confidence going forward as well. 2022 was quite a challenging year for global equity markets. Could you talk us through how you navigated the trust through such a challenging market environment? I think when you look at the market drivers within what sectors did well, is very much one of value style did well and defensive stocks did well versus cyclical stocks, which fared a lot worse given the fears over the global economy and also the growth style. So those tech sectors, which have done incredibly strongly over the last 10 years or so, obviously fell back quite significantly in 2022. Now, given our mandate to be pretty much an income fund probably expect us to be a little bit more value than say growth there's a real lack of dividends there but also going into 2022 we had been moving the portfolio a little bit more defensively so stocking up in the likes of tobacco shares and those things form better now don't get me wrong we didn't call it completely right clearly still had cyclicality within the portfolio that performed particularly poorly but i guess on a global basis it was a resilient performance should i say from the trust overall i mean looking at the performance of the FTSE itself there was quite a large divergence in performance so you had the top 20 stock of the FTSE outperforming the rest of the market by quite a significant margin. Did that weakness provide you with any opportunities? I kind of think it did towards the end of the year. It's quite interesting when you bring up the 
divergence. It's just really quite stark just how big that divergence was. So I've mm-hmm. actually got the figures. So uh, the FTSE all share was flat over the year. The FTSE 100 was up 5%. But actually those top 20 companies were up 15.7%. So these are typically you know, your oil and gas companies, your mining companies, AstraZeneca, these sort of companies. But actually within the FTSE 100, the other 80 stocks within the FTSE 100 were actually down 17%. And that was more in line with the FTSE 250, which was down 17.4%. So actually, the UK market looked in the whole as very resilient. It's very much driven by a very small subset of stocks, which yeah. are very large in the context. And that really created that opportunity because actually within the lower end of the FTSE 100 or in the 250, certainly some of those cyclical stocks, those valuations came back a long way. And certainly towards the end of the year in Q4, we did start to add to the cyclicality within the market, really, adding new stocks such as Spectrus and also buying into HSBC, so buying into bank where we see good dividend growth going forward hopefully and you touched on valuations there and uk valuations overall haven't been this cheap for quite some time but however we haven't seen a convincing uptick in flows to suggest that investors have confidence in the uk market what do you think that is I think there's three points really. Firstly, over the last few decades, you've seen this structural shift away from the UK. When I started in the city 20 years ago, big pension fund schemes, big life insurance had a big 70% of allocation towards UK equities. Over the last two decades, you've seen that dwindle away why people have de-risked their pension schemes, gone more into bonds. They've also gone more global in terms of their equity exposure, etc. So that UK allocation has gone more down to single digits now. So you've had selling pressure across the board. I kind of feel that's played out now as it come to the end. I think the second thing that made people come away from the UK and not really look at it is because we have been through a period of the last 10 years where we've had ultra low interest rates and that's been the benefit to more growth stocks. And as much as I love the UK equity market, we don't really have much of a tech sector, much of a growth sector. We're much seen as, as a value market, really. I think it's been people looking more towards the US rather than the UK. You can probably come on and debate about where inflation interest goes now, because actually value might start having its day, but we'll come on to that. Third and the final point, which is, I guess, the more short-term issue is, is more about the political uncertainty. I kind of joke, my daughter has uh, already in a lifetime has seen four different prime ministers and six chancellors she's four years old i think just for people outside the uk looking at the political situation it's just a real head scratcher for them i think we just need a bit of stability we need a bit of visibility in terms of brexit and what sort of trade deal we are actually finally going to come out of this and are they going to lower the barriers there to free up a bit of trade free movement of labor and stuff like that because it is hurting the uk economy certainly when we versus what's going on in europe really so there's a couple of things that i think you need to get resolved before people start looking at it but as you say hopefully at some point that will the valuation there and hopefully that will start playing out and certainly if overseas investors don't come in or don't appreciate that value I think you'll certainly see a pick up in m and activity. I mean you touched on inflation markets are saying that inflation has already peaked or is peaking but you hear from the Bank of England that they expect inflation to remain elevated for some time. What is your take on inflation at the moment and how is this impacting your investment decisions? Inflation has peaked. You can see that in the data, both in the US and the UK. The big debate is what sort of level that falls down to or settles at. I mean, I suspect we're probably not going back to that ultra low inflation environment. You've got a couple of big themes out there that I think are going to keep inflation higher for longer. Now, I'm not suggesting we stay at 10%, but there's no reason to suggest we can't settle at more like 3 to 4%. And I think those big ones is over the last two decades, the theme of globalization really has put pressure on inflation and brought that inflation down. Now, I think given what's gone on with the pandemic, I think given what's gone on with Brexit and the trade war between the US and China, I think actually the reverse is going to happen. I think you're going to see more reshoring, bringing manufacturing facility back into the countries, etc., which will be inflationary. I think the other big theme is green infrastructure. Certainly the war in Russia and Ukraine has shown the world we can't rely on Russia for oil and gas needs going forward. There's already big spend going into green infrastructure, but I think that's going to accelerate and clearly that's going to be expensive. That money pouring in, I think, is going to be inflationary as well. So a couple of big themes, I think, that will keep inflation higher than what we've witnessed in the last 10 years at the moment. I think that will then drive the debate about what sort of types of stocks you want to own. Because if inflation stays higher for longer, interest rates stay higher for longer, and clearly in that environment, I think if you look at over history, previous periods of inflation and interest rates, generally value styles do better. When what we've seen over the last 10 years has been the exception to the rule, mm. where we've had ultra low interest rates and ultra low inflation, and that's when gross stocks have done incredibly well valuations haven't really mattered going forward i feel valuations will matter a lot more talking about the types of companies you look for previously pricing power as being the key factor for companies to be able to pass on those costs 
However, as you say, with them facing a triple challenge of high interest rates, high inflation and weakening demand, what are you hearing from some of your portfolio companies about potential margin pressure? I think it's going to be difficult this year. I think companies are, when they put their outlook statements out there, there are that cautious guidance built in there. The good companies will keep trying to push through pricing power and generally they will, but there has to be that point where the elasticity of demand just can't take much more. At the same time, that's kind of where expectations have moved to. Analysts have started to downgrade their forecasts on the assumption that your top line is now slowing down, you've still got margin pressure, so that's going to squeeze your profitability. But I think that's baked into analyst expectations, but also where valuations have gone to. As we talked about, outside the top 20 stocks, we've yeah. seen a big drawdown in markets and valuations have started to reflect the slowing economy, the pressures that companies face in terms of their margin. And I think for us, it's about going in within the market and finding those companies where we feel either the valuation is now discounted too much in terms of where profitability can fall to or where we think analysts have got it wrong in terms of the weakness of the earnings coming through. So I think those are the two key for us. Another big factor which is China's reopening as well. That's been well received by investors and will also have a positive impact on the global economy. How does this feed through to UK companies and what percentage of revenues come from China? The main sector is probably going to benefit the most is probably the mining sector. You're already starting to see that where commodity prices have started to rebound quite strongly having a soft H2 last year. So within our portfolio we've got big holdings in Rio Tinto which is more of an iron ore play that goes into manufacturing steel. You know, if the China economy is going to start growing again, not that it went backwards, yeah. but you know what I mean. In terms of that economic growth is going to start accelerating again. Investment's going to go back into infrastructure, into housing, etc., like that. And that will play into steel markets. We like Anglos as well. You know, it's a bit more diversified in terms of copper and iron ore and PGMs as well. And also buying into HSBC late last year. A lot of bad news from Hong Kong and China was probably priced into the valuation. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a bit of certainty that actually arrears, loan losses, impairments, etc., from the region is more underpinned from here given the economic growth, then actually that should benefit as well. The trust can also invest in bonds and bond market experienced a huge reset in interest rates in 2022. However, 2023 looks like the year bonds will be back in fashion. Have you been increasing your allocation to bonds? And if so, what type of bonds have you been buying? It's interesting because we started 2022 at probably our lowest allocation ever to bonds, right. so around about 10%. That's versus our benchmark where we would typically own 20%. So quite a big underweight there. For the fact that interest rates were incredibly low, credit spreads were incredibly tight, etc., there wasn't much value versus what we could get in terms of dividend yields from the equity market. And what we did through the year is bond yields moved out and credit spreads started to widen. Actually, we started to allocate a bit more capital back into the bond market. Firstly, in US investment grade credit, you could get some of the highest quality corporate bonds out there. We were getting some good opportunities around yield to maturities of sort of four and a half percent. And then what we did post the mini budget disaster in the UK, <laughs> where guilt yields rose quite significantly back end of September, we actually started allocating to UK investment grade bonds as well. So buying good quality issuers such as Sky, Nestle, which has got some sterling bonds out there, those sort of things. But we're getting them on a yield to maturity of you know, 6% plus. So yeah. being a bit more opportunistic there to increase the bond exposure. So I think we've gone from about 10% where we were at the beginning of the 2022, around about 14, 15% where we are today. Uh, and again, depending on where bond yields move to at the moment, you know, spreads are still a little bit too tight for my liking in terms of the economic outlook. But I think we keep that option open and if we do see opportunities, we won't hesitate to keep moving that up. You mentioned structural trends when you were talking about China. One of the structural trends that's back in the limelight is that transition towards a cleaner and more sustainable global economy. Now, you hold companies such as BP, Rio Tinto and Shell within your portfolio, which are perceived as dirty or sin stocks. What role do you think these companies can play in that transition towards a cleaner, more sustainable global economy? I think they play an important role, don't get me wrong. The majority of their profits for BP and Shell come from the extraction of oil and gas, which is obviously highly carbon emitting. But at the end of the day, if governments want to hit their net zero targets, carbon emission targets, etc., they don't have the capital to be able to do it all themselves. They need the private sector to do that. And one of the industries with the deepest pockets is the oil and gas companies. And I think they need to be responsibly running down their old oil and gas assets responsibly but they also need to be investing in clean energy technology, which they are doing. Now we can debate about whether they're moving quick enough. You know, I would prefer to have something in terms of the holdings there can actively 
use your shareholding as an engagement tool for talking to management teams about their transition plans, etc. Some other funds will obviously exclude them completely. I think it's better to own something in the sector, work with management teams, try and push them harder in terms of their transition plans, etc. Because we need these companies to invest if we're going to meet those longer term goals in terms of getting into net zero. You know, some of the topics that we've talked about, inflation, interest rates, etc., that all have an impact on dividends. And with a recession now, the base case for the UK economy. What is your outlook for UK dividends in the coming months? If you look at the market aggregate in terms of dividends paid, given we went through, I call it the dividend recession that was a pandemic, the likes I'd never seen in my career. We've seen two good years of recovery in terms of 2021, 2022. But actually, the aggregate level of dividends is only back to where we were in 2016. Now, when you look at payout ratios, they're still in a good place. When you look at balance sheets, we're actually going to this downturn. We're caught with some generally very good, strong financial health in terms of their balance sheets. I don't think there's anything to suggest anything to worry about in terms of actually overall dividends. Having said that, there are going to be companies that will cut their dividends, no doubt. The likes of the mining companies, they have a set payout ratio on earnings, which is obviously linked to commodities prices, which had a poor year last year or the second half of the year, certainly. So the payouts that we saw last year, probably not going to be repeated at the same level. They're going to come down just naturally because of the way the maths work. You've also got house builders. You see a slow in housing market, probably going to see dividend cuts from that sector. Having said that, though, you've got dividend growth out there. I think the energy companies, again, where the oil price is, are probably going to continue to grow their dividend and also the bank. Banks' dividends have come back, but they're still below where we were pre-pandemic. And if you think about the profitability of the banks today, where interest rates are now 3.5% versus where they were pre-pandemic, where interest rates were effectively zero, they're making much more profit, which should be able to come back to shareholders versus dividends. Ultimately, those two factors cancel each other out. And I think we're expecting not great dividend growth from the market as a whole, but I think low single digits is the kind of thing we're expecting. And with most of the bad news already priced in to UK equity markets, what other risks do you think investors should be wary of in 2023? One thing I'm mindful of is valuations have come off their lows. Markets have sort of bounced from their October lows, really. So that's because I think markets got oversold in terms of people worrying about the severity of any sort of recession coming. I guess the risk there is, I think there's going to be a mild recession. If the market starts getting a wind that the recession is a lot more severe, then I think that's a risk to markets. The reason I think it's going to be a mild recession is because corporate balance sheets are strong, unemployment is still low, the labour market is still tight, and the banking system is incredibly well capitalised. You haven't had this huge build-up of credit like we did in the GFC prior to that. So I think we're going to this downturn in pretty good health financially. So that's why I think it'd be mild. I suppose other risks that I can think of is probably inflation. If inflation stays high, you know, double digits, high single digits, then I think that's going to be pretty hard for consumers and companies to continue to take. But the evidence we're seeing, some of the forward indicators can signal that actually it's coming down quite quickly as well. And I think the third big risk is clearly around uh, Russia, Ukraine. That escalates and that's going to be probably a material hit to markets, although it's very sad to see, but some form of stalemate that we're seeing. If that continues, I think markets can wear that in the shorter to medium term, really. So those are the three risks as I see it. So still quite a lot to look out for, but some yeah. reasons for optimism. Don't get me wrong. I'm very much valuation focused. And I think valuations are already discounting quite a bearish outlook. I do accept that the economic outlook is pretty uncertain. But the one thing we need to remember is the share prices will bottom before the economy does. Equity markets are discounting mechanisms and they will start to price in a recovery before that recovery starts. So I think you can't throw the baby out with a bar of water. In these sort of times, I think you've just got to be very disciplined in your investment process. Find those good quality companies where you think the valuation is just discounting far too much bearishness and where you think you can own it for the longer term. And that's what we're trying to do in these uncertain times, really. Great. Thanks for joining us, David. Thank you. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances, 
and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulated record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Sanderson Investors. Janus Sanderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Sanderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janice Henderson Fund Management UK Limited, Reg Number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, Reg Number 260 Each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate, London. EC2M 3AE and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and Janice Henderson Investors Europe S.A. Reg number B22848 at 2 Rue de Bitborg, L1273 Luxembourg, and regulated by the Commission de Surveillance du Secteur Financier. Janice Henderson. Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Henderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janice Henderson Group PLC. Yield. The level of income on a security, typically expressed as a percentage rate. For equities, a common measure is the dividend yield, which divides recent dividend payments for each share by the share price. For a bond, this is calculated as the coupon payment divided by the current bond price. Dividend yield, the dividend yield, expressed as a percentage, is a financial ratio, dividend slash price that shows how much a company pays out in dividends each year relative to its stock price. Balance Sheet A financial statement that summarizes a company's assets, liabilities and shareholders' equity at a particular point in time. Each segment gives investors an idea as to what the company owns and owes, as well as the amount invested by shareholders. It is called a balance sheet because of the accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus shareholders' equity. NAV, the total value of a fund's assets less its liabilities. Cyclical stocks companies that sell discretionary consumer items, such as cars, or industries highly sensitive to changes in the economy, such as miners. The prices of equities and bonds issued by cyclical companies tend to be strongly affected by ups and downs in the overall economy, when compared to non-cyclical companies. Value Stocks A value stock refers to shares of a company that appears to trade at a lower price relative to its fundamentals, such as dividends, earnings, or sales, making it appealing to value investors. Growth Stock A growth stock is any share in a company that is anticipated to grow at a rate significantly above the average growth for the market. These stocks generally do not pay dividends. This is because the issuers of growth stocks are usually companies that want to reinvest any earnings they accrue in order to accelerate growth in the short term. When investors invest in growth stocks, they anticipate that they will earn money through capital gains when they eventually sell their shares in the future. 